collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up this week, can the Cyprus rugby team, the Muflons, extend their record-breaking run of wins against Hungary? Our finances are, are so uh, restricted that we may not be able to bring all of our overseas players over for this particular game. The Faros Chamber Music Festival kicks off next week. There is now an awareness that cultural tourism and niche tourism is very important to change the image of the island and to rebrand it. The Home for Cooperation in the Buffer Zone celebrated its third birthday this week. Between these walls, contacts have been made and relationships built, helping Cypriots to develop different perspectives, which in my view is an essential element of a lasting peace and stability in Cyprus. And Turkey has been ordered by the European Court of Human Rights to pay 90 million euros compensation to Cyprus. So that the Cyprus government, acting in fairness, will compensate Turkish Cypriots who have been harmed by the events over the last 50 years on exactly the same level as Turkey is paying the Greek Cypriot relatives. huge game coming up now for Cyprus rugby. You will know, I'm sure, that it is the most successful team in rugby sporting history. Alexander McCowan is the spokesman for the Cyprus Rugby Federation. He's with me to say exactly what we can expect when the Muflons take on Hungary on Saturday. Well, this is a crucial game for us. It's the eighth game of a two-year season. We've played 7-1-7. Seven, seven. But this is the most difficult side we have played. We only beat them by one point in Budapest. And we are slightly concerned this time because our finances are, are so uh, restricted that we may not be able to bring all of our overseas players over for this particular game. But if you don't win, it doesn't matter because you're still going to be promoted, aren't you? Indeed we are. We're going to be promoted. But then again, you see, we're becoming rather vain now about our world record. Uh, we hold the world record for consecutive international wins, stands at 22 now. If we win on Saturday, let's go to 23. All the harder for anybody else to beat, and it is a very big ask anyway. I mean, do the guys, when they get out on the pitch, think about that, or actually are they more focused on the game in hand and the fact that although it's nice to win, and although they can afford to lose, what they really want to do is to beat the Hungarians? No, that's absolutely right, even though the Hungarian um, ambassador will be there on Saturday to welcome his team. And whilst we all say we totally concentrate on the game in hand, if you look at our publicity photographs, you'll notice we always seem to have a banner ready after the game, which says uh, world record holder of well, 21, 22. And of course, I'm sure there will be a banner ready after the game on Saturday, say, when a 23rd uh, consecutive win. So we do have it in mind and it is rather intriguing. I think when you look at the pool that we call upon in, in this country, we have probably less than a hundred players worldwide to call on. And if you if you look at, for instance, if you want another example, the, the English have over 198,000 registered players and yet we have managed to maintain this winning streak for five years. Which is quite extraordinary. So let's look at next season, because you are going up. It could be the Hungarians go with you, couldn't yeah, it? They could. um, yeah, they could. So who will, who will be in the pool for the next season? Well, they, they have an interesting situation at the moment because they've got playoffs for the, those to be demoted. But we anticipate uh, Israel will be there, uh, Norway, we believe, Lithuania, we think, is there. So uh, there are five teams in each of these leagues. This is Division 2B. And slowly, slowly, we've worked our way right the way through from uh, Azerbaijan uh, five years ago. Now, now we're playing local sides like, like uh, Israel, for instance, and uh, we'll see how we get on with them. Well, obviously, the boys want as much support as they can get. So where should the Cypriot public and rugby-playing fans be? Well, it's... Uh, 
kick off three o'clock on Saturday, seventeenth of May. It's at the National Pafiarco Stadium. Very nice stadium for us. It's our home ground. Tickets available on the door, and of course it's free for children. And we uh, have attracted over the last couple of years more and more school children to come and watch the game because now we have the academies established in Cyprus. We're one in Nicosia, one in Limassol, one in. Power Force, and of course the bases, the military bases have their own academies as well. So we're getting a lot of interest in young people these days, and from parents. And I think much of this has to do with the behaviour of some of the soccer teams and their supporters. Yeah, because rugby, although it looks much rougher when it actually comes to the play, is a much more gentlemanly, one might say, game. So it is then on Saturday, and will it be televised for people who can't get down to Paphos? Yes, indeed it will. Uh, LTV, uh, not only our sponsor, but they carry, uh, one of our sponsors, they carry our uh, live games. And uh, intriguingly, one or two of the big Tavernas, soccer, supporting Tavernas in Nicosia and, of course, in Paphos uh, and Limassol will be showing these. And uh, we might say it's some, somewhat of an educating process as well. Keep up to date with events and news in Cyprus with the Cyprus News Digest. You can stream it live on mycyradio.eu, listen again on the Cyprus Mail website, or download the podcast to your phone or tablet and listen anytime, anywhere. Music lovers are going to be thrilled to know that a week tomorrow, the 14th International Pharos Chamber Music Festival kicks off. The performances will be taking place at the Royal Manor House in Kuklia and at the Shoe Factory in Nicosia, both of them venues well known to lovers of classical music, as indeed is my next guest on the program. From the Pharos Arts Foundation, Garo Keheyan. Garo, 14 years. Did you ever think when you started this that it was going to take off the way it has and become the feature on the calendar that it has? Not really, Rosie. Uh, things have a, a, a way of just developing and growing organically, uh, as indeed the foundation has, has grown over the years. And as you know, of course, it's, uh, Cyprus is in crisis, and uh, we, along with the island, are in crisis as well. It's very, very difficult to maintain the foundation and the festival when um, so much of the funding has evaporated. But uh, yeah, 14 years is, is, a, is a chunk of time and we hope to be able to, to continue and reach uh, our 20th anniversary in six years. You've attracted, I think, a lot of interest abroad because this now brings people to the island and we've heard so many times that we need more visitors, particularly in the off-season. Have you got any connections with the Cyprus Tourist Organization or indeed other groups who are mm. doing something a little different than the sun, sea and sand holiday? Well, as a matter of fact, I had a meeting with the director of the Cyprus Tourist Organization just earlier this week and he informed me that they don't have a penny to, to allocate for such things, which I find very, very um, sad, actually, because there is now an awareness that cultural tourism and niche tourism is very important to change the image of the island and to rebrand it. It's all very well rebranding something, but if you haven't got anything to offer in the end of the day, I don't think the rebanding will really work because uh, you have to have something substantial to offer. Well, you have got something substantial to offer, of course. Do tell us what's coming up in the coming weeks because uh, this one runs, I think, to the end of the month. Yes, that's right. We start the festival on May the 23rd on Friday and it runs through to the end of the month. And as, as in previous years, we have a star-studded uh, cast of, of extraordinary musicians with a few uh, regulars, of course, but also some, some new names appearing as well. And it's a huge privilege, I think, for this island to have such extraordinary artists visiting and performing a very, very um, eclectic, I would say, program with, of course, the main uh, so staple of chamber music repertoire, but also some very unusual and very interesting recitals will take place and, and concerts. So j just a few of the new names that will be appearing this year? Well, we kick off with a fantastic French pianist, Francois Frédéric Guy, 
It'll be his first visit to the island, and he's prepared a wonderful program. In fact, last night I was listening. He's playing the major Beethoven work, the, the last, actually, piano sonata that he wrote, which is one of the, the great works in the piano repertoire. And only last night I was listening to Claudio Arau and Richter performing these works. So it's so exciting to, to you know, compare and then to hear this great interpreter of our time playing this very, very important work. So we have these, I think, extraordinary opportunities to, especially for music lovers, you know, to expose themselves to great interpreters of our time playing important works of the music literature. So that's um, the first concert. These are, the first three will be in the shoe factory. And the second concert will also be, I think, a very extraordinary and very important event because it will be with our dear friend Mahanis Sahani, who's made, uh, since he came to Cyprus three years ago, and this is his third visit, he has uh, really established himself as one of the great harpsichordists of our time as well. And he's got a fantastic program of... Uh, Baroque uh, music for the harpsichord with well-known figures like Frescobaldi and Scarlatti, but less well-known also um, composers like Merula, Storace and Kuchna, who was the predecessor of J.C. Bach at the uh, Thomas Choir in Leipzig, which brings me on to the second, a uh, third concert, which will be the great a cappella male uh, choir from Leipzig, who are all graduates of the St. Thomas Choir, this famous boys choir from Leipzig. And they will give um, a concert in, in the uh, shoe factory on Sunday, the 25th of May. Now, it's a, a packed program. Then, of course, it moves to that gorgeous uh, venue of, at Kuklia in Paphos. How many concerts have you got down there very quickly? We've got uh, five concerts in Kuklia, and then we've got four concerts in the shoe factory. We end the festival with... Uh, a final concert on Saturday the 31st of May in the Shoe Factory with Yevgeny Sudbin, who is also known to Cyprus, has been here before and again is one of the great pianists of our time, together with uh, Alex Chaushian, the cellist, who is the artistic director of the festival, a co-artistic director of the festival. And all of this information, I know, must be up on your website, but uh, tell us about the ticket sales and uh, where people get them, because you did in the past do season tickets, didn't you, for all the concerts? Yeah, but we have, uh, you know, trying to uh, do our bit to encourage people to, to come. We've reduced our ticket prices to 10 euros, which is absolutely, I think, rock bottom. I mean, it, it would, if we were to... To, to cover our costs, we would need to charge 100 euros per ticket. So, you know, it's a symbolic, uh, let's say, uh, ticket. And uh, they can be purchased, I think, online. And I would encourage people to, to reserve in advance because both venues have limited seating. So I'd very much encourage people to book in advance so they're not disappointed. And uh, the website, I think, where people can get all of this is farosartsfoundation.org. Correct. So if you want to find out more about the 14th International Pharos Chamber Music Festival, kicking off uh, on the 23rd of May, going through until the 31st, then do check out the website. You can book online. You can also book at a box office number, which is 709304, between 9.30 and 11.30 in the morning. In collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar. So the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio and David was going to reform White Snake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely what are we doing with children, what are we doing with adolescents and what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation. The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries where we found something we didn't know existed.
Cyprus has been divided for 40 years, and although since 2004 it's been possible to cross the Green Line, to do so you have to show your papers, and if you travel by car you must buy insurance for the other side. Simply put, there is some movement, but it's not particularly easy. However, meeting people from across the divide became somewhat simpler three years ago, when the Home for Cooperation was opened. Sitting opposite the Lidra Palace Hotel in the buffer zone, a derelict building was lovingly restored to create a meeting place that cut across the red tape. Last weekend it celebrated its third birthday, and the UN Secretary-General's Special Representative in Cyprus, Lisa Buttenheim, spoke to the gathering. Three years ago, almost to this day, I stood out on the steps in front of this, this nice building, together with the leaders of the two communities, the vice president and the president and vice president from the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research, whose vision inspired the Home for Cooperation, high-level representatives such as Ambassador Schulerud from Norway and others from the diplomatic community to welcome its opening. It was a wonderful moment. For many years, this space had been a rather sad and dilapidated place, a symbol, like many others, of the division of the island. In fact, this building features in many of the UN's own photographic archives of the buffer zone, opposite another icon, the Leisure Palace Hotel. Today, however, the Home for Cooperation stands restored and vibrant making its own mark of renewal and encouragement along the path to resolution of the Cyprus conflict. When it opened in 2011, the Home for Cooperation aimed to be living proof of what could be possible with education in Cyprus, a common space for cooperation, dialogue, and interaction based on mutual respect, providing new opportunities to bring fresh ideas and trust to the debate that is so critical across this island. Now it is no longer an aim or an aspiration, it's a reality. Over the past three years, many people have passed through your doors, sharing ideas from different walks of life, listening to each other's visions, searching for solutions to interconnected issues and problems. Between these walls, contacts have been made and relationships built helping Cypriots to develop different perspectives, which in my view is an essential element of a lasting peace and stability in Cyprus. We know that the two negotiators here with us today, my good friends Andreas Mavrianis and Kudret Ozersai, have met at the Home for Cooperation to discuss the way forward, and they meet here without the United Nations. This shared common space allows for such encounters. The utility of such an excellent facility aside, what I find genuinely heartening about this space is the access for all Cypriots. The United Nations has consistently underscored the importance of a vibrant and engaged civil society and an informed public in moving the peace process forward and in ensuring the sustainability of a future agreement. The Home for Cooperation has played and continues to play its part in advancing these efforts and ideals. Also addressing the event were the two negotiators, Andreas Mavroyanis and Kudret Orzese. I spoke to Mr Mavroyanis afterwards and asked him whether having such a venue made his job easier. Certainly, and uh, personally I'm all in favour of whatever comes from the grassroots. I believe that what we are doing in the political process is one thing, but what is happening between people in the civil society, in grassroots, is most welcome and it needs to be a parallel track and not necessarily have to have the blessing of the political leadership. So it should be the other way around. We need to take into account whatever happens in the civil society and their input is very important and is increasingly important. And does it mean that 
there is an impetus now. I, I'm getting the feeling, I know we've so many times yes. had our hopes raised that something really will happen this time, but there does seem to me that this time there is this groundswell of opinion of people saying, surely the time has come. Yes, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, it's not a guarantee for success, but what I can say is that there is certainly a momentum, both when it comes to the political process, but also when it comes to the civil society and things are happening on the ground and uh, people are building initiatives and things, you know, in the cultural, the educational, the social field. So it's a, a period where the civil society started thriving and building things. On the political process level, what I can say is that, okay, uh, we have important divergences and gaps, but there is very strong strong commitment and determination and we're working very, very seriously uh, and uh, we hope that uh, we might be able to bridge uh, the, these gaps. I cannot uh, say when and how and if uh, this will happen, but the fact that we are working in a very good atmosphere uh, in spite of the difficulties is a very, very positive signal and I believe that uh, it might lead to something. Greek Cypriot negotiator Andreas Mavroyanis, along with a lot of other people, as I'm sure you can hear in the background, at a jolly gathering marking the third birthday of the Home for Cooperation in the UN buffer zone. You can listen anytime, anywhere to the Cyprus News Digest by subscribing to the podcast. The European Court of Human Rights ruled on Monday that Turkey should pay 90 million euros in compensation to the relatives of the missing persons and to the enclaved Greek Cypriot residents of the Karpas Peninsula. It's all due to the violations arising from the Turkish invasion of the island in 1974. With me is lawyer Achilleas Dimitriades, who is well known in Cyprus for all the different cases he's brought to the European Court of human rights in relation to properties lost during the invasion and the missing persons. Achilles, this is, I think, the biggest compensation that's been awarded by the European Court of Human Rights. Where does it take us after all these years of litigation? Well, uh, it's certainly groundbreaking. I mean, uh, the, the fact that this judgment came out in the way it came out uh, is really astonishing, and it is a humongous a step in the protection of human rights. But I think in fairness to your listeners, we should analyze it on two levels. I think it should be analyzed on the European level and on the Cyprus level. On the European level, uh, I think if one looks at the judgment itself, um, will confirm the groundbreaking nature of this. Uh, when the court talks about a new era in the enforcement of human rights and the judgment marking an important step in ensuring respect for the rule of law in Europe. This is the kind of talk that the Supreme Court of Europe in terms of human rights uh, is expressing itself, not just for the Cyprus-Turkey scenario, but possibly for the Georgia-Russia issue, or more recently, uh, the Ukraine versus Russia situation with the Crimea. So we're looking at uh, dispute resolution mechanisms before the European level, uh, which have an effect on how states uh, interact with each other and how violations of human rights are now punishable with specific amounts of money. And I think that is the first time we have seen that kind of uh, judgment and it is certainly a groundbreaking position. Now, it's something, I presume, from what you've said, that governments may take into consideration before they act in future. Absolutely. I mean, the award made, not just the fact that the violation was established, but that part of this violation now has a price tag, could act as a deterrent for rogue countries which are thinking of violating human rights in another country. And I think I'm right in saying that Turkey is still liable for damages despite the passage of time. And if they don't pay up in the 18 months they've been given, a penalty will be added. Does this mean that the longer they delay paying, the more they're going to have to pay? 
Absolutely. The, the system in Strasbourg, and this is nothing new, it's nothing specific to the, to the interstate case, is that normally three months is allowed to the state that has been awarded damages against uh, to comply with that. And if within those three months there is no payment, then there is interest at a rate which is three percentage points above the European interest rate. Currently, that is about 1%. So if Turkey does not pay within the three months, there will be at least a 4% interest charged on the amount. I think that's fair. It's something that has been going on in Strasbourg for a very long time. And uh, the country that has an award against it cannot get away by not paying and therefore enjoy an interest-free loan. So we have that. Of course, nobody wants to go on uh, not being paid just because the interest is good. I think the important thing is to concentrate on how people uh, will make Turkey comply with this judgment, which is not an easy job. No, can they make Turkey comply? I mean, they took a very long time to pay to Tina Loisi, didn't they? Well, yeah, but doesn't this case remind you of that? I mean, the statements that are coming out of Ankara in terms of this judgment does not bind us, this judgment is legally flawed, and that sort of thing, is is exactly what they were saying in 1998 when the award against Loisi came out. And then five years later, sure enough, they came and paid up with interest. Now, that was a payment to an individual person. Uh, One thing that I think raises a few questions, who is going to receive this money? I know who the uh, court says should receive it. Is that going to be, assuming Turkey does pay up, what do they do? Write a cheque to the Cyprus government and it's up to the government of the day to hand it round to whoever is entitled? Well, uh, there's two issues you raise. The first issue is whether Turkey is going to pay the Republic of Cyprus because Turkey says that the Republic of Cyprus does not exist, so it would be rather strange for it to pay 90 million to a state that it does not exist. But I think there can be solutions to that. Uh, The point is that Turkey has to cough up 90 million plus interest. Now, how does the Republic of Cyprus deal with the distribution? The judgment has already pointed that out. It has 18 months from the date that the money is received to set up a system under the supervision of the Committee of Ministers to distribute the funds to the people that are entitled to that. And that is 1,456 families of missing persons as identified in the judgment, which among them will have to split 20 million, and the other 60 million will be given to the enclaved. Now the question is, who are the enclaved? And we have two limits as to that calculation. The first one is 1974, when there were about 20,000 enclaved in the Karpas uh, Peninsula, and today where there's just over 300 people left in that. And there will have to be a policy decision to be taken as to what will be the time which will be considered as the one applicable to determine the number of people that were in fact enclaved. And perhaps one will adopt 1994, which is the date on which the application was filed before the court. But people should rest assured that if their relatives were living in the Karpas Peninsula and they were enclaved and they have unfortunately passed away, that is an inheritable right and the heirs should be entitled to whatever compensation is finally handed down to the people who are entitled to this money. Now, we've been talking about the enclaved and the missing. You, of course, deal very extensively with the property issue. Does this have any bearing at all on how things proceed in that direction? Well, it has a huge bearing in that it has now clarified that the setting up of the movable property commission in the occupied areas uh, after the Dimopoulos judgment is no bar uh, to the continuing violation that Turkey is committing for property rights. Uh, To put it in the positive, just because Turkey has set up this commission is no longer absolved from the liability that it has because of the continuing violation of Greek Cypriot property rights in the occupied areas. So just because there's this committee set up doesn't mean that Turkey should not stop from giving out properties to foreigners and selling Greek Cypriot land and all those things which have established the violation so far. So it's a very important judgment in that respect uh, because it is now clear 
that even though the property commission has been set up, this in no way changes the obligation that Turkey has to stop committing the violations. And then, of course, we also have to look at the fact that if we're talking about missing people, there are missing people on both sides of the divide. What is the future prospect of Turkish Cypriots taking the Cyprus government to court in trying to get compensation for their missing people? Well, if I were the Cyprus government, in an effort to be balanced in my approach, I would come out and say that whatever compensation was awarded for Greek Cypriots, that compensation will be made available to Turkish Cypriot missing persons when the Greek Cypriots are paid this amount of money. So that the Cyprus government, acting in fairness, will compensate Turkish Cypriots who have been harmed by the events over the last uh, 50 years on exactly the same level as Turkey is paying the Greek Cypriot relatives. In that way, the Cyprus government will show to the world how fair and how representative it is for the whole population of the island of Cyprus. Well-known Cypriot human rights lawyer Achilleas Dimitriadis talking there about the landmark decision of the European Court of Human Rights this week. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.